We've started recording the meeting. And if you could just please sign in. Are we ready to go? Yes, we are. DJ, you, you want to kick off? Thank you, Trustee Prasad. Sorry for the delay. I was just trying to fix my uh, my earpiece, which wasn't connecting to my computer. Thank you for, for bearing with me through that difficulty. Yes, we are here for our board budget subcommittee today is February 8th. We are here for the meeting, which is dated February 9th. And at this point, we will see if there has been any public comment received in advance. Uh, I have not received any, Director <coughs> Pasquale, have you received any public comment? None, sir. And Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer? None at this time. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, thank you, Mr. Gephardt, for letting us know uh, that you're not providing public comment in the moment. We will move forward with our agenda, and I will turn it over to Trustee Prasad and Trustee Zhang to carry us forward in the meeting. Okay. Very good. So let's go line item by line item here. The number, the first one with the budget impact is 10.1. Um, I said learning uh, for Walters. So this is being paid by the site funds, right? Or Title I funds here. Yes, that is correct. It's an expenditure out of the site based Title I funds. And it is for IXL, very uh, popular and common learning curriculum program. And it is specific to Walters Middle School. And I see there's a 5% increase in the price, uh, which uh, uh, I suppose. So, so have we negotiated on that or is this the best price that uh, the price increase? Uh, have we, uh, have we done our due diligence on that? I will have to ask our, uh, business team if there was any negotiation to be done there uh, generally our IXL rates are based on an overall participation cost and we do our best to negotiate the lowest rate we possibly can from there um, I'm not sure if there's potential for a greater savings with other other schools in the future and or if we may already have reached some additional savings because we have other schools participating in IXL as a district Okay, and just the, the, the providing a software industry perspective is that there are a lot of prices are going up, but potentially only temporarily because of all the supply chain related issues. So uh, as we accept um, higher pricing for this year, that should not become the basis for the following. They should keep, be cognizant of the fact of uh, how how the overall industry is working. I'm not too surprised by seeing uh, some of these increases. But uh, the school finance works slightly differently, so we should be uh, looking at rolling those increases back next year. And I, and I would just like to add that some of these programs are being used by schools, staff, students particular this one and um, 
to change it for it, it's difficult to negotiate when some of these vendors are you know they're the only ones that produce it they're the only ones that make it so either we convince our staff and students to change platforms which is really hard to do Mm -hmm. um, but um, Dr. Rocha is is somebody who's very diligent about cost prices. So um, the increase is twenty two hundred dollars in a program that provides additional support to students. Um, I believe we're in the we're yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. It's okay. Uh, I, I didn't want to belabor the point. So I understand when you are in a in a, a little bit of a non-competitive situation, your captive audience. So for the, for, I, I just wanted to provide industry perspective that some of the increased pricing are uh, just being justified by supply chain related issue, uh, cost increases. So when we are signing those, uh, that, those contracts, late, then we'll go back and look at this again next year. So, Oh, okay. One question I have is, is this the, uh, water is the only school using this program? Okay. It, it's the only school that's subject to this contract. Uh, we can pull out other resources and, and we can go back and research for you if uh, what other schools are using IXL. Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head all the schools that are using IXL. But I know it's a very common uh, learning platform. It would not surprise me at all if we have other schools using IXL. Uh, okay. Another question is, if, let's say, other schools are using the same program, are they coming together for the renew or they are going back separately by each school? Generally, when we negotiate the software contracts, we do that as a district. And so right. we, may, we may have an add-on to an agreement. Uh, but usually the companies look at the number of participating students across the district when establishing the rate that they're going to charge us. Okay, so then by based on this, shall we say that this is a, looks like it's only being uh, contracted with one school, right? Otherwise, we would have a lump sum uh, contract together. Well, this I... I can only speak to this agenda item that in and of itself is for Walters mm -hmm. and it's being paid for out of their title $1. We may I have, see. we may have other schools that are using IXL under existing agreements with IXL. I see. I see. Okay. All right. Okay. Then moving on to 10.2, uh, it, it takes a village. Maybe you can explain this uh, agenda item for the public. Yes, thank you. This is agenda item comes forward as a recommendation and out of discussion from our African American Parent Advisory Council. And it's a $40,000 expenditure from our e-log dollars. And this is an opportunity to connect and engage our families. And the intent here is to focus on this program, these expenditures on our black African-American youth within Fremont Unified School District. And there's a number of different things that will be happening from outreach to presentation to additional services as well. And so we were grateful that through the recommendation of the African-American Parent Advisory Council that that came forward and we were able to expend e-log dollars to accomplish this goal. And it's coming forward for the board's consideration. I don't have any other questions on this one. Um, I do have a question. I asked a CG before, and this is um, I, I like that it's a um, a, a program a link to students with parents, and um, I am approached by another company. Actually, they are providing twenty four seven um tutoring service so i would like to talk to um maybe at a different time with cj and uh and our instructional service or letty about whether we can you know give that a try 
or we can do both. But that is right now it's a free uh, a trial, you know, to see whether students would benefit. When they need some help, they can text a phone number, whatever, a, a app, and they would get help right away. Um, That's certainly something that we can talk about. I think it's, it's always good advice when approached by a company to uh, refer them to our department that, that oversees that work. In this case, it would be instructional services because in, in a later point in time when there are agenda items that might come forward for approval, it's generally the cleanest process to utilize staff to carry those forward. If there is a program that you're interested in, certainly we can take a look at that and see how it might apply to our students, to our community, mm -hmm. to our families and staff, and consider how we might be able to expand any offering of resources we provide to our community. Okay, I would uh, talk to you later about this. Okay, then moving on to 10.3 and PA and PS. I don't see anything extraordinary in those uh, expenses. Uh, anything to highlight? Uh, no, this is just a few placements in NPS for students who require a non-public school setting and an agency, non-public agency services. And we are still within our adopted budget and we'll be monitoring that carefully as we move forward. So we are now down to the, the last less than 20% of the budget remaining. So uh, any projections on whether we'll uh, we'll get to through the year within the adopted budget or no? Uh, I don't have a projection in the moment. I'm very hopeful that we get through. Normally when we look at non-public school, non-public agency contracts and placements, those fall off significantly as we get towards the spring because students are uh, already in a placement or with an agency for services. And then the next time we see those come forward in a larger amount are at the end of the school year. And those are agreements that we sign in preparation for the next year. So uh, hopefully over the spring, we don't have too many additions and um, we'll just have to monitor. There are some circumstances that change. For example, uh, we can never predict if we might have a student move into our uh, school district that requires such services, um, and, and we won't, we wouldn't know that until they get here. Okay. Um, now, that brings up an interesting question. When you sign these contracts, if a student moves out of the district, are we still liable to pay for the services that we contracted for? No, generally generally not so within each selpa each special education local planning area and even throughout the state uh, there is generally a provision that the services within the iep that the student has when they move uh, need to be honored for a certain period of time as a baseline of service and then each school district after a certain amount of time generally within 30 days has to conduct their own initial assessment of that student so when we have a student leave who requires these services, the receiving school district generally holds them in what is referred to as a stay put placement and or a 30 day placement. And then they conduct their assessment to determine if those are the same needed services. And so that's true for when we get students from other districts or when other students uh, leave Fremont Unified. And, it's, uh, and if they're moving out of state or moving from out of state, uh, uh, then, it, then it, is everything reset immediately or, uh, or does this transcend state boundaries? It's the same general principle. Um, when you receive a student from out of state, you would be looking at their uh, IEP and their individual plan, and you would work to provide a good faith effort to provide the baseline of services that exists within that and then you conduct your own assessment within the first 30 days to determine if that's the that's the level of program that's appropriate for the student based on your district okay. then moving on to next one 11.1 uh, which is orders listed by number Anything extraordinary to highlight here? Uh, no. One question. So 
last meeting we approved uh, an increase in the contracts that you can uh, that staff can sign uh, with the meeting prior approval so uh, i'd be interested in seeing how many of those come come along but we won't see that in the list right so uh, this is just one big list of years that's correct you you wouldn't see that in this exact breakdown you you'd have to be looking at a, a different breakdown of purchase orders but the actual approval of that is coming forward for uh, board approval in this meeting. Uh, the last meeting was just the first reading of it. So okay. once it's approved, then we, we might be able to summarize what, what contracts fit within that new bandwidth. Okay. And moving on to 11.2, um, payroll. It's pretty much really anything extraordinary here. Yeah. No. Okay. Then eleven dot three is uh, notice of completion. Is, is there a fiscal impact to this agent item? No. Then we move on to eleven dot four. Okay, this is a disposition of a personal property. Uh, again, no no fiscal impact, so we'll just move on. 11.5. This is the one that we just talked about to increase the um, increase, uh, amount uh, of, that we delegate to staff. So no, no budget impact uh, because of this. And then 11.6. Yes, again, for Rick Glankler, um, Steve Zang, you, you've been following this closely, right? So, do you have any questions on this one? Well, yes, I do have this question. I do have questions. So, um, I see that this one is um, is initially intended for our own uh, maintenance department to do the job. But since that we are short in a staff, so we are going to site, uh, assign to outside a uh, painter. Um, but I'm curious, I mean, those painting jobs are supposedly to be uh, included in the general uh, construction. Is that an, a normal practice? Or we always allocate the, the, the painting job to our uh, maintenance people? I don't think that we always allocate that to our maintenance, uh, to our painters. Uh, but I think given the fact that Rick's was a, a relatively small campus compared to many of the other construction projects that we complete, it may have been deemed feasible at the time to have our staff do the painting. But with the pandemic and all of the other challenges that we faced related to staffing, related to allocating our staff to facilities needs, um, it, and where we are in the timing of the project, outsourcing the painting seems to be like the most appropriate step at this time. But for our larger projects, painting would likely be included as part of the original project scope. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting thing to just look at the bid. And it's coming from um, 274,000 and comes down to 56,000. That's like a huge, huge difference. It's, uh, I'm just surprised. Uh, uh, so what is this, uh, the first one? Is this a local company? I see their name uh, all over Fremont. Have we used them before? The Jim, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim Ness painting uh, company? I don't have off the top of my head the information of whether or not we used uh, him and his painting company before. Uh, I, I have to research that further. What I can share with you is that as an independent contract, outside of the general contractor, uh, since I've been in the districts, we have not used this vendor. So unless they are under a subcontractor that, that's hired them to do some of our projects, the district directly has not hired that company independently since I've been here. Uh, okay. Uh, so here's another question. So if we use outside a uh, vendor and... Um, 
Is it cheaper than use labor, uh, the union uh, contractor? Well, our, our preference is to always use our staff for anything that we can because we believe in the quality of their craftsmanship and the ownership of their work at the local level. Mm -hmm. But uh, given the limited resources and time, uh, that's why we went outside. And I, I don't know what the full cost analysis uh, would be of those two scenarios. But given that we are nearing completion of the project finally and thankfully, uh, we want to make sure that we get the painting aligned and done. Uh, okay, so I, I do have a, maybe this one I do not understand. Um, so in general, when we hire a general contract for doing major job, we need to hire people under the union, uh, labor union. So for the small project like this, we are free to hire anyone. So then that way the cost is uh, cheaper, you know, compared I think, with the... I think I might have misunderstood your question. I think you're referring to the project stabilization agreements and the project labor agreements mm -hmm. related to union work. And I'm, uh, I don't recall, I apologize off the top of my head. Uh, at this moment in the day where our threshold is for the PSA, PLA requirements for for Fremont and what the cost analysis or impact of that may have been on, on the scope of this bid. If you'd like, I mean, I would like to share that um, any work that's done at a school site has to meet at least prevailing wages. So there is a requirement for all painters or anybody that we seek to provide proposals for the district needs to at least pay prevailing wages. And since we have a project stabilization agreement, it would have to be the greater of the two prevailing wages or the rates that are being paid to uh, the actual the actual unions, the actual Teamsters, the actual uh, unions that are out there. So their rate is higher than prevailing wages these contracts need to abide by the agreement we have with our trades. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, then let's see, moving on to the regular agenda items. So the first one that has uh, any uh, budget consideration is 15.5. We use the top 51. So, um, Superintendent Kamek, you want to explain this item for the public? Sure. Thank you, Trustee Prasad. 15.5 is an agenda item which encompasses a broad range of facility needs. And the purpose in bringing this item forward is, uh, as many people may recall, that the board meeting happens in public as it's supposed to under the Brown Act, but it's also the meeting of the board in the public. And so when we have a, a broad range of construction projects of this nature, and we want to bring them forward for the board's review and discussion and direction, we need to agendize them as such and allow the board the opportunity to engage in conversation around those items. What you have here is a list of projects that come close to a projected sum of about $21 million. And that includes aspects of the district facilities such as tax stadium, uh, the field turf, and the actual track uh, material itself, as well as uh, about $13 million in roofing needs that have been discussed previously in, in different settings. And there are additional facility needs that have been identified, such as uh, the need for increased parking at Hirsch. We have a baseball backstop at Irvington High School that we'd like to extend to provide more protection uh, to the neighboring community. And there's also been community interest in a cricket field. And we also are working to address uh, shade structures at multiple sites as well. So these are all coming forward to, dis to the board for discussion. The funding source that is uh, a topic of conversation for these items is related to Prop 51 reimbursement dollars. And those are dollars that are reimbursed from the state for other facility projects that have taken place within the district. 
uh, of note on this topic specifically, I reached out to our chair for the FAC and CBOC to engage in discussion around these items. And when we get to the meeting on Wednesday, I can discuss a little bit more about uh, my feedback from those representatives and uh, be happy to answer any questions that come up today in terms of the, the fiscal implications for this agenda item. Okay, so I, I suppose we'll have uh, an open discussion there um, in the board meeting. So some of the feedback that we are getting from uh, community members uh, uh, are either supporting this or asking for, okay, why not this, why not that? So there are multiple different considerations that are coming along. So um, we should discuss that in, in the board meeting tomorrow. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, you're on mute, Trustee Zang. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so this one actually is, a, it's a, uh, the recommended action is authorize the use of Proposition 51 for the following project. And uh, my question is, um, so when you move the Proposition 51 back, to, are, are we going to just use the money for those following projects? Are we going to, Put this money back into the the what do you uh, measure e the construction fund the general fund I mean construction fund and then together we're going to look at overall priority and so if in that way we cannot decide the priority we're going to have to look at a, a bigger picture with the bigger pool of the project. So in terms of that question, Trustee Zeng, the item is listed for action, discussion, and information. Staff listed the agenda item that way to allow for the most flexibility. The board is not required to take action uh, tomorrow night. Uh, the board can give direction to staff. If there is something that the board would like to take action on, we are provided that ability within the, the way we crafted the agenda item. And as you've noted, there may be some discussion related to where do the Prop 51 dollars fall. And as you've noted, we have a broad range of facility needs. We have facility projects that are budgeted and outlined under Measure E. We have other existing projects that have fallen below the funding line for Measure E. And so this will be part of what is an ongoing conversation for school districts of the immense facility needs and the mm -hmm. limited facility resources. This money coming from Prop 51 does need to be restricted to facilities. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's put in a specific facilities fund or a different facilities fund, it is uh, categorically for facilities and nothing else. But that will be part of the conversation. And we have these emerging needs that take place across districts at different times and in different places. And there's also emerging opportunities uh, that we may want to be mindful of discussion and consideration as well. So this is a, a, a very complex agenda item. And part of the reason that we're bringing it forward is for the board to have that opportunity to discuss these things and give direction to staff. Okay. And also just one quick question on that, uh, the budget. So we're looking at the budget for uh, 2014 uh, of various, uh, you know, roof material cost. I mean, the budget. And then we do the B column, which has uh, estimated the cost of escalation 5% times eight years, you know, from 14 to whatever today, this year. But I see the number of escalation does not add up. So, and also, I mean, I just thinking, let's see, when we approve those budget, we have to look at the estimated budget again to see how accurate they are. Yes, and depending on board direction, uh, we would formalize many of these things. So, for example, our estimates on just starting at the top of the agenda item on tax stadium, their estimates in consultation with representatives from the field. They're not formal official bids. And we wouldn't go out for those formal official bids without direction from trustees to do so. So what we're trying to bring forward is our best context, our best guess as to where these prices might land so that the board can have some consideration for 
these decisions. And we, we wouldn't want to bring forward the agenda item for trustees and not be able to at least put some framework of cost associated with these items. Okay, thank you. Okay. So if there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next one. So this one, I thought I understood it, but I, I think I need more explanation on this one. So. Uh, it would be our pleasure. I'm going to turn this over to Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer. This is related to Centerville and uh, the next phase of our project, which is funded through Measure E. And the dollar amount uh, is $5.6 million. And staff has done some work to reduce that from a higher amount uh, than what was originally possible. So uh, Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer, can you give some additional context to the item, please? Absolutely. The district um, received a proposal from the general contractor uh, to establish an additional uh, GMP. And this, this cost came in initially at $6.6 .6 million. In looking at what encompassed the $6.6 .6 million, there's, there's a couple of things that were included. One of them of the modernization of building three, I'm sorry, building G that includes the locker rooms and also the drama rooms. And included in that, in addition to that, there was cost associated with interim housing for the locker rooms of almost $1.1 million. So when, when staff saw that, we realized that none of the other middle schools that were going through this conversion process had had any interim housing for locker rooms. Uh, we proceeded to reach out to the principal at the school and have a conversation with him about the need for uh, interim housing. There's, there's two concerns about interim housing. The first one is the cost, the cost of 1 .1, almost $1.1 $1 .1 million for something that will be used temporarily. And the second one is for these temporary buildings to be placed, they would be placed on a very small footprint that the children have to access to even do PE. So in conversation with, with the principal, um, we were able to uh, determine that uh, there's, there's, there's a way for, the, for not needing this interim housing and that um, the students would not be dressing out for the period of time that uh, the building G is under construction. So we asked the general contractor to revise their pricing and in the revision, the costs came down to $5.6 million. The reduction was approximately a million dollars. So that's one component of this whole transaction. The second component is the amount that was originally budgeted and approved by the board for the construction costs of this project. And that was $59 million. Um, there was also a meeting that took place in January of 2020 in which the board selection selected option two, which was to incorporate building G, the locker rooms and the drama room. And in, at that point in time, the estimated cost to do the modernization of, the, of this building was supposed to be about $3 million. So the budget for construction, um, for the overall construction at Centerville is supposed to be $62 million. There were a few more increases to the budget pertaining to uh, pre-construction and additional pre-construction amendments that increased. And then there was an, a GMP, the first GMP one, uh, the second GMP of $56 million. When adding the third GMP, which is the one we're asking the board to approve tomorrow, um, the total cost is $66 million. Um, the amount that's needed that we're asking the board to authorize to move within that budget is $4.7 million. Three would come from other construction within the same budget, not taking from any other construction budgets. 
from um, planning cost and from uh, contingency. So those are the three budgets that would be adjusted within the $90 million budget for this project that would be to increase the construction line item within that budget. So I, I cringe at using up contingency early in the project, right? So after this, we'll have about 1.2 million contingency left. So, um, and from what I've seen so far, we have used up every con every penny of the contingency. So, is this a realistic uh, way of handling uh, this budget? So, the project is um, this is the third and final phase of the project. Um, okay. The two other GMPs were to incorporate the the cost of the major construction of this project. So. This, this third request has to do with the one building. Um, so the overall budget for this project was 90,000,000.233. Um, what we have in commitments is $71 million. What we're asking uh, to increase the $5.6 million, there's planning money, and then there's also other construction cost and then there's the, project, the projected contingency of $1.1 million. So there would be $1.2 million left within uh, this particular budget for anything else that might come our way. Thus, one of the reasons why we looked at reducing the cost of this project um, and not having the interim housing, uh, because that would have brought us to all the contingency being gone. Well, actually, I appreciate that the staff actually found this and, and saved us that money. So that's, uh, that's uh, um, uh, the staff deserves a bunch of thanks for that. Being vigilant is, is critical. Um, so we, we should, uh, uh, so I mean, I, if I look at this uh, the spreadsheet here, uh, out of 90 million budget, 71 million, by the current commitments, we add 5.6. There's still 12 million left. And you're saying this is the final phase. So is it possible that we'll come in 12 million under budget for this thing or? I, I don't believe that to be the case. Um, the, I was hoping you had a yes answer. I'm sorry? I was hoping you'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm hopeful. But one of the things that you need to, um, that, that we that's included in here, $3.5 million, is the practice of adding overhead cost, line mm -hmm. item I. And the line item I is the line item that, uh, that applies the overhead cost of 4% to each of the projects. So this is a cost that uh, will most likely occur the only two items where we may be able to generate some savings is in planning because the planning stages have already been concluded. So I'm hopeful that we'll have $2.7 million there and that we don't have any other items under other construction costs. So the realistic number that we're looking at for potential areas of need would be the planning costs, other construction costs, and of course, the contingency. Okay, sounds good. Trustee Sam. Good night. Um, Trustee Zang, I think you're on mute. Sorry, here. Um, I, I do not understand why initially the the locker and drama room is a, is a is a three million and then suddenly it's changed to be five point six million. I still don't get it. I, I thought that's because you're doing the same thing and now it's a after reduce one million for the interim uh, locker room, and now it becomes the number becomes uh, five point six million. So it's almost a double. 
I, if I understand correctly. Yes, you do. And the primary issue, I believe, has to do with um, when these, when the estimate estimated cost was developed, and that was in 2020. So the board was presented with this price or this cost on January 22nd of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, that was two years ago. And the thing, the, the issue is that we've had several things happen, right? From 2020 to 2022, one of them is the issue of COVID. And COVID has caused us problems, not just with being able to receive the items, but also with the increased cost. So the fact that um, the there's an increase in cost for everything, for uh, we know what's happening with, it's a 7% increase approximately this year in increased cost. So when the general contractor um, went out to bid this project now, two years later, subcontractors are looking at the increased cost in wood increased cost in steel and so this is the proposal they they provide to us as far as what the cost is now um, we can certainly try to negotiate a, a further reduction uh, but the we we have two things working against us right us trying to get these schools ready for when our middle schoolers our, our sixth graders move into these schools and trying to get these schools done on time. So if we delay moving forward with this project, um, the cost could go even higher. And so we are in a huge disadvantage because of the cost of the construction materials that are needed to do what we need to do in those schools. And so the other mm -hmm. piece that increased the cost is that when the project was brought to the board, it was supposed to be a simple modernization. However, when the plans were submitted to the Division of State Architect, the Division of State Architect required that we seismically retrofit this building. So the, the increased cost in seismic, seismically retrofitting the building has also cost this, this cost to go up um, because now you're talking about reinforcements, roof reinforcements and and unfortunately, you know, it's, 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 see, um, the Division of State Architects' responsibility is to ensure that our buildings will withstand a 10.0 earthquake. And when they evaluated that building, they determined that it wouldn't. And so mm -hmm. they required for us to do multiple upgrades, not just a modernization upgrade, but also to upgrade this building for seismic. And that caused the building to go up in price as well. Okay, so um, that's like a hundred, a hundred percent increase. I would like the number of a seismic retrofit number separate. Absolutely. So I, okay, and and also, I mean, I want to know that what in general is the the items in uh, what do you call that? Other renovation? What do you call that? Let me see where is that. Here. You said in, you're gonna take money from other construction items take that money and put into this category and uh, mm -hmm. and so usually what what items are covered into that other construction items so if if there is something that's outside of us awarding a contract so for example if we decided that for that campus we would want to retro um, modernize five other portable classrooms Mm -hmm. Well, this is not this this particular. This is where we would look to to take the money from. We wouldn't take it from construction costs because that's the obligation we have with a general contractor. Okay, and usually when you do this uh, allocation, what percentage you know as a, a rule of thumb you put into this other construction category? Is that you know? Is that as a rule of thumb? Do you have that, or is just case by case? It's case by case, and these budgets were developed way before my time, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't specifically, I wouldn't be able to specifically share with you how these. I know that the percentage for 
for the the one under letter I has to do with overhead cost. Um, mm -hmm. The projected contingency is usually um, it, it's usually five percent. I'm not sure if that's what was used here. Furniture and equipment inspection totals. So uh, I'm sure there's a method to creating these budgets, um, but I don't know what percentages are being laid out in these total budgets. Okay, I, 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 for you. I would like to see whether we can continue negotiate to reduce this uh, 5.6 million. Because anything saved here, we can put into some, uh, we talk about, uh, you know, small project like uh, uh, cricket field, any other things. And uh, this is the time we're spending to, to really look at number to see whether we can push the number down again. I mean. I appreciate that feedback, Trustee Zhang. I think you know that would likely be a discussion for the meeting on Wednesday night, if that's a direction okay. that uh, the, the board as a whole would like to give to staff. We can certainly consider how to best meet that direction of the board. Um, okay. we, I think as Associate Superintendent Pfeiffer pointed out, uh, we want to be cognizant of the timing of the project and the completion of the project. But if that comes as a direction of the board, uh, staff would be happy to move forward with seeing what else we can do to reduce the expenditure on this item. Okay, so last question. What, what is the projected finish uh, completion date? So we're expected to move our Centerville students, our Hopkins students, and our Thornton students uh, to all of their middle school conversions in the start of the 2023 school year. 2023 okay that's uh okay all right fall of 2023 yes okay thank you okay that was the last agenda item with the budget impact um, so, are there so any, mr brian um do you have any comments All right. Yeah, Mr. Gephardt, he's on mute. Okay, I um... okay. maybe he's stepped away. So um, then we can adjourn at this time. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye.